1 Peter chapter 1, uh, we should be starting in about verse 17 as of today. <clears throat> Hope that you've been enjoying uh, this study through 1 Peter. Uh, chapter 1 has taken us quite a few Sundays just to get through, uh, simply because it's so uh, full of rich content that affects our lives. Uh, it affects everything about us because it sums up the situation uh, that we get to be in. Uh, we've talked about uh, verse 2, a lot of these key words that we never want to forget as we're going forward in this study. First of all, that we are elect. God has predestined us since the beginning of time. Uh, we're, we're, we've heard this word, we've come into his faith uh, because he sent his son. And he sent somebody at some point, whether it was your parents or somebody you met at Walmart, who told you about Jesus, and now you've heard the good news. And so you have that. You have sanctification of the Spirit. Have you ever sinned? The answer is yes, but you get to have a clear and free conscience. What a great thing. Next thing, grace and peace multiplied to you, all things that we want. And so the blessing that we're talking about is, is very substantial and it's something that we all, uh, I would think at least, as somebody's out there in the world and you're telling them about this, I think they'd at least listen because we got some good stuff here to be able to tell them. So that's the understanding that we go into this study with. He, he, he goes ahead and, and comes on out with it in the very beginning. I think that's a great model for us as we share the gospel with other people. We don't, don't necessarily need to get into the weeds and all the maybe stuff that gets complicated and it goes way over people's head with deep theological truths of the Bible that people may take a lifetime to even understand. Tell them what we just talked about right there. That probably might catch their interest and then we can go forward from there. And so Peter models a great way to start. Understand that Peter is going to be one of the best to learn from as Peter was an unschooled, unschooled, ordinary man, okay, or ordinary man. And so he really was just a fisherman. He knew how to catch his fish, uh, wasn't, you know, this uh, super smart, uh, deep thinker of the ages where people from all around wanted to come and see what earthly wisdom was going to come out of his mouth. Uh, you know, that was happening for Aristotle and Socrates and all them. Peter, eh, not so much. And yet, Jesus called him to be a fisher of men. And so, who then became the expert of reaching out to people? Uh, Peter uh, fell into that category, and he's, he's modeling exactly what we might want to get into here at the beginning. So, <clears throat> As we understand those things, we get to verse 17. He says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So we kind of jump right in where we left off uh, in the last lesson. Uh, we talked about people uh, learning about this salvation, learning about all that's being offered here. We gird up the loins of our mind, so we're preparing our mind for what is to come. We're resting our hope fully in the grace that is to be revealed to us. We're going to be obedient children. We're not going to conform to former lust. We're going to be holy. All these things are things that we as Christians are going to take part in. He says, if you're calling on the Father, by the way, God shows no partiality. He, he's not worried about some other characteristics, but he wants to know, what have you been up to? Okay, what have your works been? How's your conduct been? Uh, you know, uh, skin color, uh, how much money you've got, uh, your background, uh, partiality on that, mm, not so much. But according to your works and your conduct, how you're living your life, yeah, he's interested in that, it seems like, from verse 17. So, if we're going to call on him, and we're going to say, you are my father, you are the one who's going to judge me someday, you're the one who's going to think of me based on these, these works here and this conduct. I might need to respect you enough to actually listen. 
And I think that's a, that's a great start here. And so I, I'm going to kind of go through a couple texts here that hit on this idea of this obedience and this uh, God being a father and kind of what that means to us. And we'll, we'll hit a couple of those verses along the way. But also what it means to be judged according to our works. There's a lot of passages like that in the New Testament. And I think if we were to just read some of them and never read the rest of our Bible, we might, might kind of be hurting on the understanding. Okay? So there's an order to this. We have to call on the Father, be interested in what He has to offer. We probably need to fear Him and know that He's up here, He's in the position of power, and we're below that. Then and only then can we actually obey. So we got to call fear, and then obey. I think sometimes as we go out in the world, we've talked about this evangelism and reaching out to people, but we want people to obey. Then later down the line, sometimes it's like, well, yeah, we'll get into the fear and the calling on God, but right now you need to obey. Well, that wasn't the order of how that happened. Call in fear, then we can get into the obeying, because that's going to come naturally. It just does. Yes? Define fear, because Revelation 2.10 says, do not fear. Okay, yeah, we, we will uh, get more into that topic. And so let's let's read uh, 2 Corinthians 5, and then if I haven't come back around to that, please bring that up again, okay? So 2 Corinthians 5. <clears throat> Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known to your consciences. And so it brings up a little bit, then not necessarily use uh, the word fear there, but we hear the word terror. Well, that sounds kind of fearful to me. So we're, we're talking along the same lines here. Okay, and I eventually will get back around to that idea. Okay, but one of the things I want to say first is I think sometimes we, we hear about the grace, we hear about the mercy, we hear about forgiveness of sins. That's what's being offered to us as Christians. And then we get to uh, a verse in 2 Corinthians 5 or what we just read in 1 Peter 1 and it's like God is going to judge you for every single thing that you have ever done and it's terror there's terror here uh, you're going to receive the things done in your body and I'm like mercy and grace and forgiveness but look at that verse and I go I don't know if you can hear that gulp in my throat <laughs> I think we do that a little bit as Christians. Well, we need to keep reading in this passage because there's there's more to learn from this. Because I start to think, okay, mercy and grace is going to come to me, but I'm going to be judged for every little thing that I've ever done. And so, am I am I doomed or 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 have I got something going here? Keep reading down in verse 17 of Second Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, he's fixing to explain it, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or reckoning or charging their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. <coughs> so, if you're in Christ, these trespasses that we have all committed, we're all in the same boat, we've all committed trespasses. If you're in Christ, verse 17, it's no longer imputed or charged against you. Keep reading, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
So we're saying, we've figured out this idea of, I'm going to be in Christ, I'm going to be a new creation. I don't have to worry about these, these sins and these trespasses in that they're not counted against me. I've been forgiven. Okay, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so all things have become new. My trespasses are no longer counted against me. We get back into the idea of grace and mercy and, and forgiveness. That hasn't gone away here. But it all starts with, like we said in 1 Peter 1, we've got to call on God. We have to have feared Him in the first place, knowing that if I don't come to Him and figure something out, the terror of the Lord is going to be upon me. Yeah, I don't want that. I don't want every single thing that I've ever done brought up and counted against me on Judgment Day. I want to be forgiven. That's what we want. Uh, and so, knowing that, we're going to persuade men and let them come into God. And then, you know, we, we are going to have a good conscience. First Peter chapter 1 uh, teaches us that. And so, we get to feel good in the sight of of God because of this forgiveness and this reconciliation. We weren't at peace, but now we can be. Okay? So, <clears throat> going from there, uh, I may go ahead and jump into this topic of fear uh, and, and discuss that a little bit. And so, feel free to, to jump in on this discussion. Uh, I'm going to do this just a little out of order of how I had it, just so we can go ahead and bring that up. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, uh, we consider the things that he went through. Then he gets into verse uh, 5, okay? And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons, said, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? So, when my dad would come at me with a spatula in his hand, he would <laughs> pop it on his hand, I had fear. I knew that I probably shouldn't have done whatever I did and that he was going to get me. I was never afraid that my father was truly going to lay a hand on me and harm me. He cared for me. He wasn't going to uh, attack me. He wasn't going to attack my mom, he wasn't going to do something that was going to hurt us because he showed his love to us. But now would he spank me pretty hard? Yeah. And so I, I think God, the way he talks to us, like he literally tells us that he is a father. As we look out into the world and we see good fathers and bad fathers, I think I think. Uh, you will know them by their fruits, uh, speaks to this just as much as anything else. You can look and see this father uh, abuses his family. This father left his family. This father did A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it ain't good. But then there are fathers who discipline and love their families, and, and they go forward with that. And if you've got a good situation and you've got a good father, the son is going to need chastening. They're children. They need to learn. They have to be rebuked and chastened and brought into subjection. And it's not going to be a bad thing. In fact, we, we should be looking for that and know, unfortunately, we're going to mess up and we need that uh, chastening uh, to be brought back the way we ought to be. And so, is there going to be a fear of respect in all that? Yeah. In fact, whenever I messed up, I really didn't want to get in trouble after that. I wanted to mess up and then just not have to get spanked. But it happened anyways. 
I think, honestly, that our fear can, can work about the same way with our own Heavenly Father. That we can know He's going to do something about it. He's going to chasten me. He's going to rebuke me. He's going to scourge me as all this goes. Uh, but that means I'm going to become a partaker. I'm not going to be an illegitimate son who God just said, I don't even care what you do. Just, just go for it. And, and basically leaves us to our own devices. Uh, at the end of the day, we get to respect our fathers just as we respect God. And so I think, I uh, hope that kind of touches on that concept of fear that uh, we are told many times in the Bible. In fact, it's one of the most prevalent uh, repeated phrases in the New Testament. Jesus said, do not fear. We've got to have courage. We've got to be able to go out in the world. Our God is our Father. He's in control. He's got the whole world in His hands. We got nothing to fear. Only thing really to fear is the one who's able to destroy soul and body. Uh, that's God. We've got to fear Him in that way. Yes. Would the fear have anything to do with Him being a jealous God, wanting us with Him all the time, and for us to fear Him and keep His commandments because He does. He is jealous and wants us to be. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a, a big part of it. Um, that, that jealousy is part of how much he desires us. Uh, we, uh, I, I can't help but bring it up again. We talked about it on, on Wednesday night. Uh, I was talking about me and Jamie walking through the mall, and uh, here comes girl after girl, and we're walking hand in hand, and the girl walks past, and you know, I turn around and say, Boy, oh, she's good looking, and uh, you know, might might have a, a chance with her. I, I mean, I think I'll just keep walking with you, but you know, she is is pretty good looking. Well, Jamie at, at this point can have two responses. Well, he's still walking with me. I, I'm good. You know, we're good. I I desire for him to be with me, and that's that's about all I want. That, that ain't gonna be it. <laughs> that's not going to be the reaction okay? his <coughs> desires <coughs> desires to be with but also jealously desires meaning I want him, I want his thoughts I want his devotion complete, complete. and that's the way God desires us it's not just like well, you know like it decently kind of follows me. He didn't he didn't turn around and follow the other girl, but where 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 is your devotion? And so there's there's some terror there that that God is a jealous God, and He's seeking us in all those ways. And so if we're trying to have a foot in both doors and do a little bit of this and do a little bit of God stuff, <laughs> that ain't good. Uh, and and you know we've 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 upset him and, and missed it on desiring him the way he's desired us. And so there is an element of, of fear there. Uh, it is so interesting and, and it's important for us to understand when the Bible says, do not fear. And then on the next page, it says fear. Well, at some point, we're going to experience both emotions, a courageousness and a lack of fear to certain things. And then on the other side of things, we will fear. But the fear that we have towards a father is always a healthy fear. Meaning, I know that this father is not here to harm me. He's not going to uh, come home one day and in a flying rage, he's just going to kill me. You know, we, we kind of joke about that with dads. Oh, I really messed up. Dad, when dad gets home, he's going to kill me. You know, we say that, but... Never, never truly thought that that was what was going to come my way um, because I knew that he loved me. And so uh, I think really if we speak of it in those types of simple terms, fearing God becomes a pretty easy concept for us to understand because we get to look out into the world. It's not, it's not some idea that's, 
It's locked in these pages that we can never grasp or understand because everyone has a father or you can see worldly fathers. And that's why God makes these comparisons and he has all these parables and these, or even in Hebrews is not necessarily uh, one of the parables from the gospels, but it's comparing God, Christian, to father, son. Now I get to understand this without having a college degree. <laughs> Everyone gets it. And so there's there's that there's that fear. Okay, we'll go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish. And without spot. <coughs> All items have a known worth. Okay? So I think of just some simple items out there. A gallon of milk. Now, some of you uh, can remember a time when a gallon of milk was, I don't know, maybe 25 cents. Is that about right? You ever have a gallon of milk for that cheap? Back a long time ago, maybe? <laughs> there you go. Well, you can get it for free that way, I guess. But okay. So obviously, inflation has changed. But nowadays, a gallon of milk costs a couple dollars. But how many people in here would go to the store, see that the gallon of milk is in today's time, and would pay twenty dollars for a gallon of milk? No hands. Okay. Items have a general worth that we are willing to spend on them. And if it's the price ain't right, we're not buying it. Okay, I looked at a couple different examples of extremes of this. Okay, Mike Tyson. Y'all heard of the, the big big boxer, big mean <coughs> boxer. He's got a lot of money from the, the people he's knocked out, punched in the face. He has a $2 million gold bathtub. Does he need that? But he can afford it, I guess, so it was worth it to him. Items have a known worth. If it's worth it to you and you want to buy it, you can buy it. Okay, he had the ability. There are uh, baseball cards out there. Y'all know famously baseball cards. It's a little piece of paper. Are you kidding? And yet they sell for millions of dollars all the time. There is a... Uh, most expensive one I know of that I could find on the internet uh, was a 1914 Babe Ruth card for six million dollars. How much it sold for? A little piece of paper. Nicholas Cage, famous actor, once bought a comic book for one million dollars. Yeah, I'm not that interested in comics. Not not one million dollars worth. You know what happened to it? Somebody stole it. So anyhow, people can go out and buy things that are worth it to them. The buyer always determines the worth. And so, as I, my grandpa always was interested in baseball cards. He's given me probably thousands of baseball cards. I wouldn't spend more than $3 on any baseball card. Because it's a little piece of paper. Now, would I buy and sell them? If, if there was a million dollar baseball card, would I buy it for three dollars and turn around and sell it? Yes. Okay, of course I would. That's the idea of like buying real estate and flipping houses. Does anyone need 20 houses? No, but if I can buy them and sell them for more, I can make money that way. Some people have that desire. Go for it. But I'm talking about people that somebody out there bought that baseball card for six million dollars and they put it over on a shelf so that they could look at it. It wasn't buying it so they could sell it and make money and have more dollars. They actually wanted the baseball card. Just to sit there and look at it and say, I own it. Crazy. I can't even understand it. But the buyer, not you, the buyer determines worth. How did God purchase us? That's on the edge of heaven either. What's that? That's on the been on the edge of having an idol. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so if you're spending that much money for a piece of paper. 
So we definitely, definitely don't want to get in the middle of that. And so God has shown us at this point that uh, we're not even talking about riches or big million or billion dollar purchases here. Uh, we're not talking about gold and silver and corruptible things, but rather, verse 19, we were purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, his very son, who was without blemish and without spot. And so we want to know, okay, uh, what was I worth to God? Uh, I may label this price, another person may label this price. The buyer determines the worth. God purchased us. He was willing to redeem us and purchase us with such a great price. And so if we want to know what we are worth to God, rather than making up our own thoughts on it, we've got to look at what he put out there. Because he just determined worth with what he purchased. We were his priority. Absolutely. And one of the cool things that we're going to read uh, going forward here is that he didn't get uh, in, a, in between a rock and a hard place and then he had to kind of buy us out of it. He had this intention from the beginning, verse 20. He indeed, Jesus, was for, foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in the last time he's made revealed to us where we can see him, who through him we believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. This whole idea was pre planned, okay? Uh, when, when I wreck my car out there, I have to pay whatever they say it is to fix it, or I have to buy a new car, and that is the unfortunate price that I have to pay in order to still make it from point A to point B. I never wanted to do it. I never really wanted to buy something that was that expensive. It's just kind of what I get forced into, okay? Uh, but sometimes that's the way it goes. Now, did we have to have Jesus on the cross so we can be redeemed? Absolutely we did. But God determined this from the beginning. Foreordained means he planned that. So before we were even created, before a first sin was committed, he, he knew about all this and he said, let's do it. Let's, let's make this happen. I want this to happen. Uh, I'm going to purchase them and show them my great love for them in what I'm about to do. And so it wasn't something that he had to make a re reactionary uh, situation. And we, he got in a rock and a hard place. Uh, but he, he planned this from the beginning. And so uh, it gets a little deep. Uh, this is a deep forward, backwards type of discussion that kind of goes over my head sometimes. But that's kind of special to think about. That, that God planned this. The price was right from the very beginning, and he still wanted to have all this happen. He knew that the creation of man, before he decided to do that, would eventually lead to his son on the cross, and he still made that decision. The thing about that that happens here is now that points us back to God. When we see that all that took place, we get to look at it and say, God did all of this. And so it points us back to him. And this is where I was really going to read Hebrews 12 to the first time. Where it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus and what he did there is what ultimately points us to the Father. There are many things I think we can look at into the world and, and say this is an evidence for God, I think there's many. But this one is the author and finisher of our faith. The beginning and end is what causes us to see God the most. The clearest picture is when we get to see God, we get to see the cross and that love that he has for us. And so uh, it's pretty cool how all that gets to be wrapped uh, together there, tied in a bow um, where, where Jesus is what authors that, he begins it, and he finishes it 
because it ends up where he's sitting at the right hand of God and we get to see both in a much clearer fashion. Verse 22 of 1 Peter chapter 1 says that since then you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Most of this passage is talking about 1 Peter chapter 1. Most of it is talking about what God has done for us. Not much of it talks about what we need to do in response. Okay? There's a little bit less of it, I'd say. But 13 through uh, 17 gets into it a little more, and we touch back on it again. We've got to prepare our mind. We've got to rest our hope. We've got to be obedient. We've got to remove ourselves from that ignorance and that former lust. We've got to be holy. All these things now... Uh, yeah, you have some responsibility that we've got to take part in. Now we've purified our, purified our souls in obeying the truth. So that's, a, that's another part of it. We've got to purify our hearts in obeying. Uh, a part of that is to love one another fervently. And so <clears throat> what purifies our souls according to verse 22? Obeying the truth. Okay? And so it's really, uh, again, we can't even look at that and start to say, well, if I obey, uh, that is what's going to make me uh, complete. And, and eventually I'll obey so well that, that God will just be so impressed that I'll, I'll have a purified soul. Well, that was never, you know, if you, if you read that into it, you kind of had an imagination and you dreamed that up. That's never what it said. Uh, this was a ministry that God put in place. It was the sprinkling of Christ's blood that actually sanctified us. But it, as, we, as we looked at this passage, if you left obedience out of it, and you said, God, I don't fear you. I don't respect you and uh, feel like I have to obey and treat you like a father who's chasing me. I'm going to do my own thing. If that was never part of it, did God ever get the chance to purify your soul? Probably not. And so that has to take place. I feel like that uh, is just so... I love how clear that is. I don't even want to get in the middle of it and try to break that up and explain it because it's there kind of waiting for us. We have to obey and become a part of this as we obey and we say, God, I call on you. I fear you. You are my Father. I will obey he then is able to bring us in and say, all right, you're a son. You are forgiven. You are clean. In all of that, it's not only how we react and, and act in, in the sight of God. It also has to do with how we are towards one another. Let's read a couple of passages along with this. Acts chapter 15, verse 7 through 9. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by the mouth or by mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by what? By their faith. And so I love how he brings up again no partiality. First Peter chapter one verse seventeen, he hits on that concept again. We still are not on that. It's all about our faith. Our faith is going to come into obedience. That's going to become our life. We're going to follow him. We're going to fear and respect and become an obedient child. As all those things take place, we get to have a purified soul. That's ultimately, I believe what we need to have and what we need to be after if we want to have a right relationship with God. We want to have a purified soul. That way God can look at us and not be ashamed and not look at all of our trespasses and our wrongdoings and everything that we've done in the body, whether good or bad. I don't want God to look at all that and see all of what I've done and have to think about that all the time. I would rather him see a purified soul. 
And that's what he's offering. That's what I want to be. And so, <clears throat> Acts chapter 15 uh, teaches us this, this, this very thing here. <clears throat> he says that God knows the heart. He acknowledged them by giving the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction. He purifies their hearts by their faith. And it really, it's amazing how much of this comes down to that faith. And we're fixing to talk about uh, verse 23 in 1 Peter 1. He talks about the word of God that lives and abides forever. How that faith in the word is what ultimately remains. Our soul being purified and also that. Uh, but this corruptible stuff, this action, this what I've done in the body, that eventually passes away. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad it does, because it's not good. 1 Peter 1, 23, having been born again, that's talking about us, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. We've already talked about how incorruptible this salvation is. We talked about it uh, in verse uh, three or uh, 4 and 5 of chapter 1. It's incorruptible, it's undefiled, it doesn't fade. And it's reserved. Okay, four action-packed words and thoughts there that tells me this isn't slipping out. It's not kind of running its course and then it evaporates and it's gone. It's here forever. That's my inheritance. That tells me I have a strong, faithful hope uh, to the end. So that's what I've been born again to. Uh, I don't like stuff that uh, might get stolen from me the next day, like the $1 million comic book that Nicolas Cage had. I'd rather be able to keep it and have confidence. That's what we have. Here's what is corruptible. Verse 24. Because all flesh is as grass. All the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers. The flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. All of this fleshly stuff, this, these deeds done in the body, for those that aren't in Christ, there is no new creation. It's just the old. And God on that last day is going to look at the people that haven't come to him and say, okay, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. It's going to be a long list of all the things that they've ever done. And he's going to look at their conduct and the things done in the body. And then what do you get? Yeah, you get the terror of the Lord. I don't even want to think about that. That sounds terrible. The terror of the Lord, what he's capable of doing, uh, considering past history, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, that's the terror of the Lord. I don't want to be any part of that. And so what that passage taught us in First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5 is we don't have to... Uh, go on worrying about that all of our lives. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. He says that we uh, have the adoption. He says that now we get to go out and be ambassadors. We get to call people into this very thing that we've been given. And at this point, uh, as uh, we learn in uh, 1 John chapter 4, uh, that perfect, uh, perfect love drives out fear. Uh, as we, we come into this relationship of obedience with the Father, do I know He's still in control? Do I still respect Him? Absolutely, I do. Because if I didn't, I'd probably go back to whatever, you know, Hunter wants to do or whatever the world thinks that I should do. I may go back to that because I've probably lost that respect and that fear and that, that feeling I should have towards God that says I'm going to follow and be an obedient child. But at the same time, I'm not looking at 2 Corinthians 5.10 and saying God's really going to get me on that last day. No. Because reconciliation takes that and says no, we've been reconciled. We're good. I don't have an animosity towards you. We're good. That's what, that's what we've got to have. Everyone deserves the chance to decide that that's what they want in their life. 
It does take decisions. It does take actions on our behalf, but uh, that's what we've been offered, and that's what we need to offer to other people. I'm glad that the flesh and all of this, uh, the actions, I'm glad all that's fading away uh, because all things will be made new. We want something else. Revelations 21, 5 through verse 7. 21, verse 5 through 7. <clears throat> then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. But I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to all who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You can see all sorts of good and bad wrapped up from the first couple verses there, 5 through 7, and then all of a sudden you hit verse 8, and you're like, ugh, that sounds terrible. But the thing is, we want to be a part of verse 5 through 7. We want to say, all that stuff is gone. And we're part of something where he says, Behold, verse 5, I make all things new. The end of verse 8 is the terror of the Lord. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's what we're trying to avoid. <clears throat> we have to understand that, that many, though, verse 8, was a part of their life. Paul. Before he was Paul, he was Saul. Was he a murderer? Yes. Was he unbelieving in the plan of salvation of Jesus Christ? Yes. I, I think many of those things would probably fit into his category. He did those things. I don't think he's going to be part of the second death, though, because he was reconciled. And so that's, that's what's taking place. Those things may have been a part of your life. That and many more other things that probably could have easily been thrown in that list. They could have easily been part of your former life. But that was a former ignorance. We saw the light of God and we became obedient. And that's the path that we take. All that matters in the end, based on what I'm seeing here, stuff fades away and yet something new comes out of it and it uh, it reigns and endures forever the thing that I see mattering here is that word that word that came to us Jesus Christ the thing, very thing that I'm offering to you right now the things that I am sharing is the word of the good news we have ears to hear it we have minds to believe it and say I accept this this is how I'm going to live my life going forward I'm going to run with that idea and uh, that's, that's what's being offered to everyone here. <clears throat> in the end, our faith in that and our obedience to it is all that matters. Because everything else is going to fade away. And so that's kind of what I leave you with today. Uh, what an encouraging thought. I don't want... All of my past mistakes, uh, ways of life, uh, this fleshly body that really is just so corruptible in many ways. I don't want that to be un uncorruptible and never fade away. I'd rather it just go ahead and fade away and then get something new that's perfect and it's reconciled. That's, uh, that's what we have to rest our hope in. If you got that, you're in a good spot.